Hello, this is the American Medical Association's COVID-19 update. Today, we're talking with Dr. William Melms, Chief Medical Officer of the Marshfield Clinic, Health System in Marshfield, Wisconsin, about vaccination in rural communities. I'm Todd Unger, AMA's Chief Experience Officer in Chicago. Well, Dr. Melms, we've seen a number of reports, including a recent study by the CDC, that reveal substantially lower vaccination rates in rural areas as opposed to, uh, as a, compared to urban ones. Uh, is this reflected in what you see in the Marshfield patient population? Yeah, thanks, Todd, for having me on, first of all. And it absolutely is reflected um, in what we are seeing. Uh, first, for the state of Wisconsin, let me just say that uh, we peaked in Wisconsin for vaccine administration around uh, April 4th. Wow, that's uh, early. <laughs> that, that was early. But since that time, if you look at the numbers, it, they, they have been uh, dropping pretty consistently in terms of vaccines administered. And so the week of May 25th, if we compare that to the week of April 4th, we, we administered about 25% of the vaccines the week, week of uh, May 25th that we did the week of April 4th. So that dynamic, of course, is playing out to a certain extent in different places and vaccine, and we're running into a more hesitant population or resistant yeah. population, you know. Uh, that's obviously a challenge in our country right now. Is that what you see kind of at the foundation of this slowing? Well, we definitely see some variation. For example, let me compare Madison to Marshfield. That'll be probably a pretty good to illustrate the point. Wisconsin is divided up into seven uh, healthcare emergency regions. Madison is in the South Central region. The, the rate of vaccine administration, so for so the percent of the population that's received at least one vaccine in that area is 55%. And in fact, for Dane County, where Madison is located, Dane County has a rate of 67%. For the North Central region where Marshfield is and much of rural Wisconsin lives, that rate is 43%. And in fact, we have two counties in our service area that have rates of 25%. So yeah, there's a big difference. So, you know, obviously it resembles, you know, even at the statewide level, kind of the blue red divide, we're seeing that uh, in the South right now. And then even within your state, what I'm hearing you say is that dynamic is playing out. Is that part of the issue here? Well, if we're gonna go the blue red divide, yes, it's part of, it's part of the issue here, but I would say, uh, and, and certainly um, along political lines, there's no doubt that there's a difference in vaccine acceptance and administration rates, but that those lines are very blurred when it comes to uh, rural versus urban. There's there's plenty of uh, of uh, political um, influence in the urban areas as well. I mean, the other divide that we're seeing is that while you know we're seeing lower rates of COVID nineteen infections and deaths. You know, when you segment that between vaccinated and unvaccinated populations across the country, you see a different story. Are you seeing that play out as well in Wisconsin? Well, it is. And it, you know, thankfully, our numbers are down so far from where we were back in November um, when we were surging in November. And the, the number of deaths each day is low. I think that our rate of deaths each day is about five patients per day right now. But but as we're seeing this, when we know that these people could have been vaccinated, I'm telling you, it is absolutely tragic. Uh, it is. Are you concerned about some of these variants, like the Delta variant that we're seeing pop up now and kind of gaining ground? Certainly. You know, we have to be concerned about the variant and, and the majority of uh, the isolates tested in Wisconsin now are, I guess it's now the alpha variant, B117 out of the UK, but over 90% of Wisconsin's uh, isolates are variants. And, um, and the, the UK variant has been the most predominant one, but more contagious, more, um, more lethal. And um, this is all the more reason why we have to get people vaccinated. Well, we've talked about hesitancy is a possible root cause of this issue. What are you seeing in terms of access, uh, which is another thing that uh, might be overlooked? Is that an issue? Uh, access is certainly an issue. Uh, you know, we have to, we can't discount that. It's not just hesitancy. If we look at rural areas, lack of public transportation, the longer distances between vaccination sites, between clinics, uh, between pharmacies and pharmacies have become a bigger uh, source of vaccine, certainly as the pandemic has gone on. 
access to technology, access to broadband. At uh, some point during this process, we really shifted our, our appointing process over to an online one. We did that for both the convenience of our patients and also for the efficiency of the process. But in doing so, we had to be mindful that many of our patients and residents in our part of the world don't have access. And so we had to maintain more traditional ways to appoint as well. And also, you know, we, we truly need from an access standpoint, we need the employers in our communities to buy into all of this. They need to give their employees time to drive to distant sites to get vaccine and to get back from the vaccination back to work. And we'd like them to have paid time off to do that. I think that would increase the rate. So what you're really facing is kind of a double whammy problem. You know, one, we're down into a more hesitant population uh, and you've got real access issues uh, in kind of these rural locations. I mean, you mentioned a problem right there. That's a, you, what if you have to drive a long way, uh, getting off work is a problem. Right. Are there any other kind of strategies you're having to employ to kind of adapt to this new set of folks? Yeah, you know, for, from the standpoint of, uh, of that aspect of all this, when we first started rolling out the vaccine program, because of the nature of uh, the vaccine, because of the fact that we didn't get much vaccine, we really were, were providing that vaccine from some of our larger centers. And now what we've done is we've taken that vaccine out, we've moved it out to more of our rural primary care locations. So we've gotten it closer to the patients. We're in the process right now of operationalizing our mobile primary care van and determining how we'll use that as a platform for vaccine administration as well. So bring, bring, it, uh, bring it to them, I guess. is uh, Absolutely. Uh, so, uh, you know, this issue of incentives uh, is something that's popping up all across the country and some employers are giving incentives, some state governments are giving incentives. Does this seem to be working as a strategy? You know, I don't know if it's working as a strategy. I'm not opposed to it. Believe me, I, whatever an employer wants to do for their employee to incent um, them getting the vaccine, I do believe that just providing them the support to go get the vaccine is probably the most important incentive. As we were ro rolling out the program for our employees, we were debating incentives and, you know, should we pay them? Should we give them some sort of stipend for getting the vaccine? And what we landed on was we um, now provide a donation. The system donates to two different funds. Every time one of our employees gets a vaccine, we make a donation to the Care for Caregivers Fund and to the HOPE Fund. Both of these funds um, benefit our employees. The Care for the Caregivers, we provide meals to frontline workers. The HOPE Fund provides financial assistance to employees who find themselves in uh, tough situations for a variety of reasons. We, we, we felt really good about doing it that way. And, um, and I, I think it's uh, at least been recognized by our employees. It's a good thing. That's a nice, uh, that's a nice incentive. Um, last question for you. The CDC uh, uh, awarded uh, Marshville Clinic $4 million in terms of a grant to study the occurrence and impact of COVID-19 in rural communities. I know it's uh, an ongoing study right now and possibly too early, but can you share anything that you're learning uh, and how it might shape our public health response? Yeah, a uh, latest update, it is too early. I spoke to the principal mm -hmm. investigator yesterday and, uh, and we don't have data yet, but basically this study, it, it is, it's the, the prospective assessment of COVID-19 in the community study is the name of the study. And we're going to be looking at 1500 rural residents over a period of a year, looking at various aspects of how the disease is transmitted, how it affects them, and how uptake of the vaccine um, somehow you know, has an effect on all of this. So we're, we're certainly hoping to get substantial information out of this study, looking forward to it, um, but we just don't have anything to report on yet. Well, that sounds like a reason to invite you back when you do have the data. We'll look forward to learning more about it. Dr. Melms, thanks for joining us today. We'll be back with another segment shortly. In the meantime, for more information on COVID-19, visit ama-assn.org slash COVID-19. Thanks for joining us today. Please take care.